Hey boys and girls, uh, welcome to Monroe Live and thanks for watching. And um, today is a big day for us. We've hit 300,000 uh, subscribers. Um, we're really excited about that. Thank you to all that subscribed. And for those of you who have uh, been thinking about subscribing, we'd really like to turn that three into a six. So please think about subscribing and, uh, and that does do uh, a wonder for us uh, here at Monroe and Associates. Today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about IDRA. IDRA is the gigantic gigapress manufacturer that was in Italy. As far as I know, we're the only ones that are gonna be putting out a, a video on the tour that we had, thanks to John Stokes and Fiori. Um, they, uh, they got us a, a tour that just knocked my eyes out. As many of you know, I was a tool maker a long time ago, and uh, this stuff really puts everything into a, a, a totally new perspective for me as far as this type of technology. I'm telling you right now, you're going to get a, a real eyeful. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching Monroe, and let's jump into it. Uh, the machine range is called the Neo, uh, and the Gigapress is part of the Neo range. So essentially, your Gigapress is the um, 5,000, 6,000, 8, 9,000 ton, and then all of these other machines around us are our bread and butter. This is what we do every day. Mm. So, I mean, we can get into the material science of it all and, and yeah. so on, but a big problem is the, uh, the speed of the cooling creates a very fine grain, grain structure. Yeah. And the elongation that we get from that is relatively low. So, mm. uh, in the event of, for example, if we're talking about a front end yeah. underbody system, yeah. in the event of a crash, we have to be careful that underbody system doesn't protrude into the cabin. Yeah. And that's one of the problems with the front end design. And most of the OEMs in the world right now are looking at rear underbodies because it's a safe bet. And I've yeah. seen the crash simulations on that. And the rear underbody doesn't move. It's solid yeah. as a rock. It right. really is. Yeah. So these are all really cool points. Um, quite interesting here right now is that this machine is in testing. So you can actually see a machine moving because not many of the machines are in. Oh, final okay. test right now so essentially this machine will be uh, tested in a in a dry capacity here in Italy we can't actually do any hot testing with aluminium really um, because of yeah. the facility so what we do is we do a dry test here where we uh, run the machine in a simulated cycle uh -huh. and uh, during that cycle we are doing a soak test for uh, 28 or 48 hours, depending on the customer mm. requests. And uh, then we will take the machine apart. In this particular case, it will go into crates and containers, and then we'll ship it off to its destination, its final destination. Mm. Um, so one of the big points that I think we really wanted to stress here more than anything else is the fact that we're not only talking about gigapresses. There's a whole world of die casting out there. And we really want to try and promote the use of aluminium into many of the other trades. There's lots of different applications, but it does need to have the volume. And that's, yeah. that's the problem because the, the capital investment is, is so relatively So what is the break-even number for, uh, for a machine like this? What kind of volumes would you have to have? No, I would say that we would uh, ideally talk to a customer and say, you've got to be talking about producing 20 to 50,000 parts a year to make the machine yeah. uh, pay its way. Okay, so we're standing in front of uh, one of the machines that's uh, slightly smaller, but we're going to talk a little bit, or actually John is going to talk a little bit, about the, um, how the hydraulics work and um, he's going to give us a little lowdown. This is going to be at a high level so that we can get it done in a hurry and we don't leave half the audience behind. So, John, go ahead. Exactly. So, here we have an injection that is our standard injection series that's been around now for pretty much 20 years or so. On this injection series, the OLCS, we use a system that's called meter out control of the cylinder. What that basically means is that the hydraulic cylinder is being pushed forwards by the accumulators from the back 
and we control the outflow of oil. This is a tank at the bottom of the machine. And here, this is a telescopic tube. So we're controlling the movement of the oil here with a valve that's controlling how much oil is flowing through. And by controlling that flow, we can control the speed of the injection. So to give you an idea, an injection of this standard can run at approximately 10 meters per second as a maximum injection speed. But normally in production, we only run at four and a half or five meters per second. So this system is great and it's worked very well for us for many years, but on the GigaPress, uh, we were completely forced to redesign the system. And we came up with some uh, very innovative ideas that have completely changed, I'd like to say revolutionized, what we do. And we chose to call this new injection the 5S. So come and have a look at it. So before, when we were looking at that, we were talking a lot about the meter out injection system. And one of the things that we had to change when we moved to the GigaPress was to consider the physical mass of the hydraulic fluid. So one of the problems we have in hydraulics is called cavitation. This is when the hydraulic fluid creates an air pocket inside the fluid, and this air will collapse in on itself, and it's a very explosive action. And this can cause a lot of damage. So when we're firing at high speed the injection, and we have the column of hydraulic fluid going down to the tank, this can actually drag the hydraulic fluid above it down and create cavitation. And this cavitation can actually destroy the seals, the cylinder, and the valve that's underneath here. So one of the things that we wanted to do was to eliminate this big maintenance problem. So if you look here, you'll see that we have no meter out valve. So we have a much easier maintenance life but we still have to maintain control. And in order to do that, we use what's called regenerative hydraulics. So we're able to take the fluid from the front of the cylinder and we're able to feed it back through these two pipes. Now, Sandy, one of the problems, as you know, is that we have problems with the volume of hydraulic fluid. Mm. And there are two movements to the injection. There's a slow movement, which we call the first phase, and then there's a second phase, or a fast movement, which is actually filling the cavity. You remember we spoke about maybe 120 milliseconds to fill the, the die. So during the slow movement, these two pipes are good enough. They can handle the flow. But then when we go to high velocity, they no longer handle the flow. And can you see the cylinder above here? Yeah. That cylinder has a piston inside it and we're able to redirect the hydraulic fluid to the top of the injection cylinder. And this cylinder above acts as a cushion. Right. And we're able to control the back pressure on right. that cushion. So by having a back pressure, we're able to maintain very strict control of the injection piston. So all of this oil that we have in the cylinder, instead of going to the tank, is all fed back to the accumulators. Now this is a huge efficiency. You remember when we're looking at GigaPress, it's huge, right? The volume right, yeah. of oil. And so by refeeding the majority, maybe 80%, right, Fiore? Just a little bit less. Yeah. Of the oil is fed back to the accumulators and we're able to top it up just by using this small pump located on the side of the press. Hmm. And with a small high pressure pump at 180 bar, we're able to maintain the necessary oil flow inside the injection, and we're able to guarantee that we have the dynamic force that we need. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like trying to squeeze old toothpaste out of a tube, right? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't want to go, so you need to have a big dynamic force to do that. And so with this system, we're able to not only get uh, an efficiency in terms of the volume, the big volumes of oil, but we're also able to get huge uh, uh, sustainability boost because now the pumps on the back of the machine are only used for opening and closing, which is more or less 50% yeah, yeah, yeah. of the cycle, right? So you can see easily here that this is a, a great saving and we like to say that with this system combined with the pumps, we're able to save around about 55%
of the energy costs on the machine. You know what, Sandy? Die casting is really easy. Die casting is just force is equal to pressure times area. That's yeah, our whole that. life. Right, yes. yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, but this one here is doing double duty. I want every either system or every part to have a multifunction capability. So this is exactly. a shock absorber, it's a capacitor, and that, exactly. on top of that, it's also an accelerator. So having three things in one <clears throat> makes me happy. I like that. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a, a 2,200 ton plant, and we're about to move to the other side of the shop, Sandy. So mm. just to give you an idea of, of this, is where die casting has been for many many years yeah and it hasn't really evolved and so what we're doing now is is not just a, a change in the automotive industry it's a complete paradigm shift for the die casting industry yeah yeah so it's uh it's a hard call we've got a lot of people to convince and uh you know there's a, a lot of skeptics out there and i i i, I, I hear it all the time yeah. Okay, so uh, we were looking at the little ones. We looked at a, a 560 ton press and you just saw the platen for about a thousand, thousand tons. This is much bigger. So, boy, you're gonna tell us a little bit about this, yeah? Yeah, this is uh, the 9,000 ton machine. 9,000 ton. 9,000 ton machine. And in this version is uh, even the high flow version. Uh, to increase the velocity of the or decrease the cycle time yeah. okay and back to the uh, uh, details of the testing okay discussed before our uh, dry cycle is uh, based on the norm uh, DIN um, 28480 okay 24480 okay that includes the most important phases okay and uh, some of those phases are the uh, what some many times the customer has to decrease uh, above all the closing phase and opening phase of the uh, the two hours mm. um, of the die okay the standard version for example you see six motors okay yeah. and one dedicated just to the injection uh, unit but the standard version is just four motors okay? yeah. and uh, uh, you see uh, a different in this uh, imaging you see a different uh, uh, configuration because usually the closing cylinder that is the part that moves yeah, yeah. the uh, uh, the movable the half yeah. die okay is a simple flange in this uh, uh, in this version you see many uh, hydraulic components yeah that we have to move from the main manifold okay that is the hydraulic manifold that feel all the uh, machine speaking about pressure and flow okay yeah. but uh, many parts but move it on the flange because of the problem and this dimension of this size of the machine is not to increase the velocity the problem is to stop it yeah yeah and so we have to keep the valves very close to the port uh, a and b yeah. forward and backward right. so this is a very special um, configuration so I have a question um, um, what what is the fill time uh, for the for this giant press so the 6,000 yeah. ton yeah. is around about 120 milliseconds yes we're guesstimating that the uh, the simulation is showing around about 180 to 200 milliseconds on this machine mm -hmm. yeah. but until we start casting yeah, you won't know. Yeah. Those 120 milliseconds uh, is one of the uh, things that the customer asked us to, to decrease. decrease. Yes. So uh, this is the meaning why we have tested the big injection with uh, different kind of valves in order to increase uh, the velocity of the second phase, or the, the first phase of the injection, but uh, keeping the pressure. And yeah. so uh, on this machine you will see the, another different configuration on the injection. Okay, Flory, I, uh, now what we're doing is we're looking at this massive uh, amount of uh, steel, basically. Can you, can you describe a little bit about what's going on? Yeah, this is the uh, system uh, that move and lock uh, the machine. So, on the two platens you have the fixed one, 
that uh, uh, allow the uh, cover die and the movable the movable one that allow the movable half die yeah okay so then you have a reaction uh, a reaction plate okay yeah. and what move and lock everything is the system uh, so limit toggle system yeah it's a system based on the concept of the locking cam. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You see, uh, it's like uh, the, the, the movement of the train. Right, okay. yeah. You see, in the middle, uh, is a, there is a cross head yeah. connected to the closing cylinder. Right. Okay. Then, on the uh, upper side and uh, the lower side of the uh, cross head are connected to small uh, um, li uh, linkage okay yeah, yeah. roads let's say roads okay yeah. and on the top and on the bottom you have the uh, the most important lever right okay so when the machine is closed you see this configuration okay yeah with the uh, two roads uh, that is the, let's see we call mother road and the uh, conduct road road yeah okay and in this phase, uh, the machine is closed and the force that has from the closing cylinder is multiplied through all the points, okay, yeah. connecting to the, uh, uh, the linkage, okay? Right. And usually the ratio is uh, on our machine, our toggle is uh, around uh, 24 times, okay? On uh, the big machine. X, yeah. Yeah, on for, the big machine is uh, 20 times, more or less. Wow. This is even to avoid to have a, uh, a higher opening close uh, yeah. because the structure is uh, when the machine open, okay, is the let's say worst phase for all the structure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the big thing with this, so what we're looking at basically is a um, is a uh, a cam section. Yes. So as depending on whether you're looking at the top or the bottom. As this thing is being closed, it reaches a certain point and then it overcloses. And that's about six millimeters, you said? Yes. That's stretching these gigantic bars. Yes. Six millimeters. Yes. So, in essence, um, we were talking about Young's modulus and stuff like that. This is actually acting as a gigantic extra spring. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. We, can call, we can call them for big springs yeah yeah we were talking before um it's easy to get things accelerated quite a big difference when you got to try and decelerate so that's why i'm glad to see that you're using the uh, a yoke system yeah 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 uh, uh, the, the the problem is that uh, uh, the acceleration is a uh, is a part of the cycle it means that you can set a ramp of acceleration yeah okay then reach the maximum velocity right and then at the end of course you have to set a deceleration right ramp okay yeah. but the problem is that uh, can happen that yeah. during the cycle you have to stop the machine yeah immediately okay so when you stop the machine in the yeah. acceleration phase uh, is not a big problem because yeah. you are still in a low uh, right. velocity value right. okay but when you have this mass, that is, uh, in this case, is uh, 90 tons, adding 150 tons of uh, uh, movable half die, yeah. you have to stop in 50 millimeters, become a problem. Wow. You can create peak pressure. Yeah. This uh, 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 means why we apply the valves that uh, yeah. um, that manage shock absorbers. This, yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And above all, you have to uh, calculate even the horizontal yeah. force, horizontal force that uh, become the inertia. Right. Okay? So again, you look at the size of this base; it looks massive. But if I have to decelerate that plus the tooling that goes in it, I can actually bend this, and that's. Yes. Exactly. Oh, yeah, this is. Uh, it means why we apply the vibropads. Yeah, okay, yeah. In this yeah. case, uh, on the smaller machine, uh, we can use a typical solution uh, through screws uh, with yeah, leveling yeah. and locking screws. Right. Okay? Yeah. But in this case, uh, the uh, vibropads uh, are help so much to absorb the the, yeah. the vibration. Yeah. Yeah. And then you you will see that 
even the main base is, uh, uh, let's say, all mechanical. But the two tanks, injection tanks and closing tanks, are connected through uh, even um, elastic uh, joint. Ah. Okay? And in this elastic joint, uh, um, move even the discharge fluid that we turn in the main tank. Mm. Where you have uh, the cooling uh, circuit for the fluid. Yeah, okay. yeah. So the one other thing that, uh, so we have a lot of guys that watch our, our program that are interested in how this works and the right terminology. In the U.S., when we when we look at a cycle that looks like that, yes, either from a bell crank or a Scotch yoke. Anyway, we call that um, uh, uh, we call that a hypocycloidal drive. So. For the guys that are out there that mm, are in the machine tool world, this has a hypocycloidal drive. I'm really very, very impressed. So I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, I see the castings. Do you do the machining yourself or do you have that farmed out or how no, is that? Basically, one of the advantages of our geographical location is being based in Northern Italy. We're in like a, a Disneyland for mechanical machining, for preparation, yeah, yeah. for castings. And it's really cool because we don't need to invest in the machinery. And you can imagine that the size oh, yeah. of the machines for these yeah. is gigantic. So basically we're able to do all of our machining outsourced. We try and do as much of it as we can in Italy. We're proud to be Italian and we want to promote the uh, Italian and the European industry. But the really cool thing uh, about this is the design change that we were forced to make with the plat. So in order to have the mechanical structure and to have the stability of the plat, we can't cast just a solid plat. Mm. A hollow structure with uh, uh, ribs and with braces is stronger right. than a solid structure, right? Yeah. As we all know. So. One of the problems we have is that the cores that produce the cavities would traditionally be inside the casting, and this would be a solid wall, mm. and you'd have the core inside. One of the difficulties is trying to control the position of that core, and yeah, you can scrap the casting, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with working together, and this is part of the partnership thing that we like to do with people, yes. working together with the iron foundry, we were able to understand that it's better if we change the design and put the core on the outside. Right. So if you can see where this wall is here, yeah. and you've essentially got this rib in yeah. the mechanical design, that is more or less where the tool is sitting on the face yeah, of yeah. the plant. So there is this material directly behind the tool to support mm. it. Mm. And then the advantage of having the core on the outside is we can control very carefully the dimensions to right. know that we have the right thickness and essentially the right thickness here that we need to support the tooling. Right thickness? Yeah, also balance. It's, uh, it's also a balance. Yeah, I mean, th this yeah. is a whole finite <clears throat> element analysis yeah, in yeah. itself, right? Yeah. And there's a huge side effect of this. And that is, we have a big problem with customers not deciding what they want. And it delays the purchase because until yeah. we finish the drawing for <clears throat> this, we can't send it to the foundry and we can't yeah. send it for machining, right? Yeah. So the advantage is that this is now a standard machining pattern right. that we do for all of the platters. And what we're able to do now, if we move over to here, up we go, and we have a look at the finished platen, we're able to do concurrent engineering. Right. So we're able to set, which is relatively <coughs> simple plate, out to a CNC machinist, machine all of the fixings, the layout for the valves, whilst this is still being cast and machined. So we're able to have this ready for when the platen arrives. Yeah. And then we just take the plate <coughs> and we're able to apply the plate directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a secondary thing that's very cool <coughs> is that we like to say that these machines are not just for Christmas, they're for life. Yeah. Okay. In another 10, 20 years, when you want to reconfigure the machine, you can remove that, that plate, platen, yeah. put another plate back on. Yeah. All set, ready to go. 
So when we talk about the mechanical uh, linkage here, what we're talking about is uh, a, a mechanical lever, which we call the toggle. Yeah. And the toggle is joined together with, strangely enough, toggle pins. Mm, good idea. And these are uh, steel on steel configuration. Uh, but we have hardened and tempered bushes with point to point lubrication. The most key thing here is ensuring that we have a constant stream of lubricant feeding mm. the pins to avoid any uh, grabbing of the pins because the pins are designed to rotate yeah. so that we get even wear on them. Right. And if you get a pickup point on any of these bushes, it will stop the pin rotating. Once the pin stops rotating, this is the beginning of a mechanical failure. And so mm. we monitor that uh, directly and you can see that the number of lubrication points here, and this is a, a steel pipe bent by hand. This right, is part yeah, of yeah. The, the art of the machine of building, um, is feeding each bush individually with a dosing system. So this is really interesting. What we've got here is a machine that's being prepared for shipping uh, to the US. Uh, what we do is we ship the machine in subcomponents, and each of the groups is put into individual crates and we're able to ship the subgroups directly to the uh, point of assembly where we will do final assembly of the machine and the testing on site with the customer. This really helps for the customer to be able to reduce the lead time and one of the heavy things that we have to do is find some way of uh, moving the lead time into a containment of 12 months. And this is the magic figure that we have to try and stay in. Get the machine to the customer as quickly as we can. One of the big challenges for us, Sandy, has been to consider the capacity that we require to follow all of the OEMs. Okay? Yeah. It's not just about one OEM. We want to follow the global industry. So as you can see right now, we've got a bay here where we can construct three machines simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And we've already cleared out all of the racking from the end of this bay so that we can have the third machine in build as required. Right now with what we're doing, we're only really seeing maybe two machines at any one time in a build. And uh -huh. we have the possibility to ship two of them at the same yeah. time. But if we move through to here, into the center bay. Into the center bay. You can see that we still have the crane capacity. Yeah. And we're also able to convert the center bay into another three machines. So this gives us the ability to produce six machines at a time, bearing mm. in mind that the machine is on the shop floor for yeah. uh, four, maybe five months. Yeah. And uh, we want to convert all of this craned area, including the racking here into assembly as required yeah but i think this is a really interesting thing right we we hear a lot of comments about Idra and its capacity you can see here we're really not stretched at all so far in terms of capacity uh that's uh that's one of the comments that i, I think i made already this looks like uh again i came from something like this industry and um with the amount of uh, the amount of assembly space you've got, to me it looks like you're running at about a third of what Correct. you could. Correct. Yeah. So, what do we mean by grouping, Sandy? What it is is we have to assemble the components from all of our supply chain, right? So we have mechanical uh, components that we have machined directly. We have uh, commercial components like cylinders, valves, etc. Electric motors. Electric motors, uh, for example. Like, yeah. And what we do is we bring all of the components together. And you can see here that they're in uh, what we call Comessa or internal order numbers. Yeah. And what we do is we collect together 80% of the machine before we allow the machine to go and take space on the shop floor. Mm. So unless our stock is at 80%, we don't move yeah. forward. Florian, thank you so much for the, uh, for the absolutely for excellent pleasure. tour, yeah. And, um, and uh, boys and girls, stay tuned because uh, we've got lots more coming. Thanks for watching.